Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Gentian Lurie, um, another one of my phenomenal ACHD colleagues and hands down the best uh, Albanian adult congenital heart disease specialist you will ever meet. <laughs> Gentian um, did his undergraduate training at Western Illinois University and then got his MD and PhD um, at University of Vermont, so I guess he's more accurately Dr. Dr. Lurie. He did his internal medicine residency at the University of Illinois at Chicago and cardiology and adult congenital fellowship here at UCLA. He's been on faculty with us since 2016 and is an assistant clinical professor of medicine. He's gonna take us through medical therapies for the Fontan survivor. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you all for coming here. Um, I'm going to focus on the medical therapies for the Fontan patient. Uh, for me as well, no disclosures. Uh, and I'm going to keep the talk brief and just specifically uh, the most important points that we have to address for a stable Fontan. Somebody who comes to clinic, they are doing well uh, and functionally without any major issues. I'm not going to talk about protein losing enteropathy or arrhythmias or other condition or other uh, complications that will be addressed later uh, in the day. So I'm going to focus mainly on the thrombophylaxis and thrombosis. Patients who have some type of cardiomyopathy, develop some type of cardiomyopathy or AV valve regurgitation, but are still doing okay. And uh, what else can we do to improve their pulmonary circulation? The, uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, we all agree that the patients that have had the Fontan palliation really at high, are at high risk for developing clots. Uh, it's been estimated uh, at, uh, in the 30s percent, some papers even the, in the 40s to 50s, uh, the prevalence of uh, thromboembolic uh, disease. And that actually can affect the right uh, or the Fontan as well as the left uh, circulation. So it's, not, uh, it's, it's, it's different from somebody with... Uh, a, a, acquired uh, heart failure or, or biventricular function. Uh, the most common, uh, or it's found most commonly in the RA2PA fontans, and as Dr. Reardon was mentioning, that was one of the reasons that we uh, moved away from the RA2PA and the, uh, the newer fontans, the extra, especially the extra cardiac uh, fontan were developed. Also, it's important to, to know that the, the, some of the classic uh, risk calculators for clot formation, like, uh, such as CHADS or CHADS 2 VASC score, really they, they do not apply to, um, in general, to adult congenital heart disease, but specifically to the Fontan patients. And some of the most, specifically speaking, some of the risk factors that apply to patients with Fontan physiology are uh, things such as dilated atrium, non-pulsatile pulmonary flow, also low cardiac output, and uh, ventricular dysfunction, that I'll elaborate a little bit more, and uh, arrhythmias, residual shunts, as well as liver disease, and the underlying coagulation abnormalities. And I should mention here briefly that it's not only coagulation that is associated with liver disease, but also the increased risk of bleeding. Um, the data, there is some data, obviously not a lot, but there is some data to guide us on what we need to do uh, in order to prevent thromboembolic events, and if they have a, a clot, how to minimize the future risks. It's generally wide, uh, accepted that the use of the uh, pharmacolo pharmacologic prophylaxis uh, uh, in the FON10 patients, uh, it, we all should be using it, and most of us do. Uh, it uh, a lot of times depends on the center, what type of agent is used. Uh, some data suggests that for patients who've done, who have never had any arrhythmias, uh, atrial arrhythmias, or any prior clots, or other high-risk factors, uh, the aspirin has been shown to be non-inferior to warfarin. And there's just a couple of studies here to highlight that. The first one on the on the uh, top right is from 2013, where they looked at uh, patients that were on aspirin and warfarin, and uh, aspirin in blue and warfarin in green, and it, uh, there was no difference in the development of uh, clots uh, between the two groups. A later study in 2015, and that's a table there from um, that, that particular study, highlights, first of all, that the risk of clot in the, these patients is very high. It's, 18% uh, for those patients who are not on anything, and this, the, the, the incidence, this was about over a seven-year uh, period follow-up. But when they compared, when they looked at the patients that were just on aspirin versus patients that were on warfarin, both, uh, they had a significant decrease of the, uh, uh, the risk of developing clot. There were no significant uh, difference between the two groups. 
Uh, and this is one of the reasons that uh, widely accepted that, again, aspirin and uh, coumadin seem to be similar. The study in 2015, however, highlighted that there was not enough data, not enough numbers to make that conclusion for the older, for the RA to PA fontans. Um, but based on the, the available data uh, in the 2018 ACHD guidelines, uh, basically it uh, states that the antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation with a vitamin K antagonist uh, may be considered, and it's a class 2B. However, patients who have a known or suspected thrombus uh, or have prior atrial arrhythmias or high, other high-risk features, and they have no contraindication to anticoagulation, a treatment with vitamin K antagonists should be offered. And that is specific with vitamin K antagonists because that, uh, at the time of the, um, of the guidelines, there is really the, the NOACs were not, um, uh, there was not enough data. However, if you look at the 2014 PACES and HRS guidelines, that was a class three recommendation on the use of NOACs, and that was not based on any data that it showed that caused harm. It was simply based on the fact that there was no data to show any benefit at all. So the HRS 2014 guidelines on the use of NOAC has a class three indication, and that has caused a lot of discussion in the adult congenital heart disease community, and there was no recommendation made at the time, again in 2018, uh, on the uh, ACHD uh, guidelines. Since then, however, the more recent study published this year and spearheaded by Dr. Barbara Molder from Holland and also our center, uh, a lot of centers from all over the world contributing to, the, to this uh, note registry, um, uh, including our center, it showed that the NOACs appear to be well tolerated. If you look at the top right, uh, panel A, uh, with red being the uh, major bleeding with blue being thromboembolism for a period of uh, 3.5 years follow-up on patients that were on NOAC. Uh, and it, there was no difference between the major bleeding or the thrombo thromboembolic events when you compare it to the panel B. And panel B is uh, that, uh, a subgroup of those patients who had been on Coumadin prior switching to a NOAC. Uh, and that the duration was basically that it did for 3.5, uh, three and a half years, same uh, duration. So the, the major bleeding or the thrombo thromboembolic events was not different when uh, you compare the NOAC use versus warfarin use. Again, the total number of patients uh, was in the 70s, 74 patients. So still a very small study, but at least it gives us some guidance that uh, tells us that the NOACs appear to be well tolerated and at least in the short to medium term, uh, uh, they uh, are comparable to the use of airframe, warfarin with regard to efficiency as well as with regard to their uh, side effects. We'll talk a little bit about, uh, I, I have the title of the talk, heart failure, but this is certainly not the type of heart failure that we're going to be talking later where the patient, the escalation of care is basically, we're going to be talking transplant. This is patients, again, that are fully functional and uh, really haven't uh, de deteriorated. One thing, one important thing to understand is that the pathophysiology of heart failure in Fontan patients is significantly different from the ones uh, with acquired heart disease. And there are many reasons for that, just to mention a few. The liver disease plays uh, a major role with, along with portal hypertension that uh, not uncommonly can cause a splanking arterial vasodilation. Then you have a lower than expected uh, systemic venous uh, uh, resistance. And really the conventional heart failure treatment that has been tested and used in acquired heart disease, and there is literally hundreds and thousands of studies, uh, that, that really doesn't apply as much to Fontan, to adult congenital heart disease, uh, generally speaking, but Fontan patients specifically. Uh, there is, so there is a positive of evidence, and however, there is very little else to offer from a medication standpoint. So we'll start with uh, some of the uh, common uh, cardiomyopathy and medication treatments that we have for heart failure. Uh, starting with diuretics, we use such uh, uh, medications, obviously, but uh, always with caution because uh, these patients, their cardiac output, their uh, blood return to the heart depends on the passive blood flow and, and an elevated uh, CVP. So the diuretics can cause dangerously low uh, systemic venous pressures, and it can exacerbate the low out, uh, cardiac output symptoms. Um, so. That's kind of a, a small caveat. Then the, the role of ACE inhibitors, actually, it completely remains unproven. There is no data 
No significant data to suggest that uh, it really works. Certainly there is no data to suggest mortality benefit, and, uh, but we commonly use it um, by proxy in patients who have ventricular dysfunction, patients who have AV valve regurgitation. Uh, if they have systemic high blood pressure and need, the blood pressure needs to be treated, uh, ACE inhibitors remains a good choice. And uh, a lot of us believe also to prevent ventricular dysfunction uh, starting ACE inhibitor might not be unreasonable. And the beta blockers actually are the ones that really, there is some, a little bit more data than the other regimens. But to keep in mind with patients with Fontan, the stroke volume is pretty much fixed. So the cardiac output depends on the heart rate. So their use needs to be uh, very carefully monitored. And without, and I'm not even going to the patients, uh, a lot of these patients who have intrinsic con conduction abnormalities, which is a completely different topic. Uh, the data is basically, uh, mostly comes from Japan. Again, these are small studies where they looked at the use of uh, specific carvedilol in patients, uh, with fo in Fontan patients. And some of the highlights are at the bottom of the slide there where it, in it increases the ejection fraction by uh, 5% in these patients from 35% to 40% with subsequent decrease in uh, uh, diuretic use. In this particular case, it, it was furosemide. And on the table on, uh, on the right there, it shows that the patients had an improvement in the new uh, NYHA uh, functional class, whether they were patients uh, that had a font hand, like that's the F group, or patients that had the just Glen at the time, that's the G group, or the non fontan group, single ventricle patients that hadn't had the, the surgery yet. Uh, all of them show that there is an improvement in the baseline functional status uh, uh, following treatment. But again, uh, no mortality benefit has been shown whatsoever. Then brings me to uh, the next few slides uh, with regard to the neprilysin inhibitors. Um, that has been, uh, has been one of the biggest blockbuster medications in heart failure and acquired heart disease. And before I talk about that medication, I'm kind of briefly mention a bit kind of the, the, the reasoning behind it. There is uh, several endogenous uh, compensatory mechanisms, BNP being one of them that we are very familiar with, that the body releases that have beneficial effects by decreasing neurohormonal activation, by decreasing vascular tone, uh, so, uh, sodium retention, cardiac fibrosis, hypertrophy, and so forth. The problem that this uh, uh, peptides are not really that uh, effective is because they get breaking down uh, immediately in the body and into inactive metabolites by an enzyme uh, specific in neprilysin. And actually neprilysin is upregulated in, in a heart failure uh, status. So the thought is if we can, if we can uh, inhibit the neprilysin, maybe we can increase the efficiency of these peptides. So, and if we can come up with a, a combination of medications that can use um, by blocking the angiotensin, uh, angiotensin pathway with uh, inhibition of the neprilysin, uh, that would be ideal. And the reason the, the, in the study we would use an uh, ARB instead of ACE inhibitors because the combination of ACE inhibitors with neprilysin inhibitor caused uh, excessive angioedema. The, and that's when the Paradigm Heart Failure Study uh, uh, basically came in 2014. And this is the, probably the largest, biggest study uh, in cardiology conducted in terms of numbers with more than 4,000 numbers in each arm, 4,200 in, in the placebo arm versus, the, in the uh, ACE uh, inhibitor arm versus the, um, in the uh, ARNI arm, uh, arm and the, that the results were astounding. Basically, there's a decrease in all uh, in, in mortality, uh, cardio, all mortality, type mortality, cardiovascular mortality, hospitalizations, and so forth, with significant and really now it has made it into the uh, arsenal of medication that we can use for uh, heart failure patients with acquired heart disease. However, really there hasn't been anything like this in uh, adult congenital heart disease in general, and more specifically in uh, the in the uh, Fontan patients. However, if we wait for a study with, uh, for patients with adult congenital heart disease that has uh, an enrollment of thousands, we will never get anything done. There is not such a thing. We'll probably still be uh, practicing medicine like medieval times and bleeding patients if they have a lot of high hemoglobin. But we base our, uh, our uh, 
you know, with anything that we can get in terms of uh, numbers and data based on smaller studies, as the ones that I, said, that I mentioned earlier. And this is our experience with the Entresto medication, um, our initial experience, just to show that it's a safe medication to use in, congenital, in adult congenital heart disease patients. Bear in mind that this is a very uh, preliminary data with uh, 15 patients, and only a small number of them are uh, Fontan patients. But it shows that it is uh, well tolerated, safe. Uh, out of 15 patients, uh, there was only one patient that we had to stop it at the time uh, because of the uh, worsening uh, kidney function. But we also noticed that a particular subgroup of patients had an improvement in the New York Heart Association class, functional class from. Um, uh, five patients initially being on class three, and then at the end of the analysis, only one of them being on, uh, on the cl with class three. So there is hope about the this medications in adult congenital heart diseases, specifically in Fontan patients. So now we are using it, and we have probably like close to 50 patients, and uh, in the process of analy analyzing the data. Uh, I'm going to go to the next topic where we have the pulmonary vasodilators. Uh, and again, the studies are very, very small. And when it comes to PDE inhibitors, some, uh, the, the data have been mixed. Some data suggests that the use of PDE inhibitors improves functional um, and in, in, in endurance, uh, and improves the max VO2 use on CPAT tests and so forth, as, so, as so shown in this study from 2008. Again, none of these studies have shown anything beyond than just improvement on the max VO2. Similar with the uh, endothelial receptor antagonists, where this is, uh, the studies have been mixed. Some of them shown no benefit, like the one to the left, where there was no difference in the maximum VO2 at, on uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. However, uh, a subsequent study in 2014 that's the, uh, in the middle showed that there is an improvement of uh, an increase in the max VO2 when you use uh, bosentan in this, per in this particular case versus placebo, significant. And if you use ambrisartan, that's the one on the right of the screen there uh, by uh, Dr. Cedars in uh, Texas, where they showed that there is a benefit in the use of ambrisartan. So uh, generally well accepted that if there is a good reason for the, such patients to be in pulmonary vasodilators to improve their pulmonary flow uh, that we use. And in, at our center, we are, we are using them in a lot of these patients, especially after cardiac catheterization, depending what the numbers show. Um, in conclusion, the Fontan palliation, palliation is associated with significant long-term complications. Uh, the, such patients do require uh, lifelong management. And definitely, definitely uh, we need a thorough knowledge of their anatomic substrate, functional and especially hemodynamic status, Awareness of long-term complications are imperative. A multidisciplinary approach is key, as you'll see throughout uh, the day today. And paucity of data, actually, if anything, it gives us the opportunity for more collaboration and research. Thank you. <laughs>